From a poor boy in London, to Thomas Edison's right-hand man, to becoming one of the foremost businessmen of the early 1900s, Samuel Insull lived a busy life. In our last two videos on him, we showed how he was able to change the way the United States electric grid was created, and the monumental business empire he accrued despite his humble beginnings. But it was later in his life that the true tragic downfall of Samuel Insull would occur, where he would find himself going from being one of the most wealthy and influential men in the country to going on the run from the law and eventually ending up in jail. So get ready for the climactic conclusion to Samuel Insull's story as we learn something new. Between 1912 and 1917, the total assets of the Insull companies ballooned from $90 million to $400 million. Everywhere they expanded, rates for rural customers were about half of those charged in other parts of the United States. Though, after about 1912, Samuel Insull supposedly had little to no interest in accumulating more money, but was becoming more focused on giving it all away. While his income in the 1920s reached $500,000 per year, he often gave away more than that, spending about $50,000 a year on pensioners people he wanted to live comfortably in retirement, often providing for former employees or even strangers who asked him for his help. Sam supported nearly every major charitable effort in the Chicago area, from establishing YMCAs for minority groups to helping fund new hospitals. Even before the United States entered the First World War, Insull, having been born in London, supported Britain by helping Americans to sign up to fight for the British. When America ended up declaring war in the spring of 1917, he was selected to head the Illinois State Council of defense. With so many Midwesterners of German descent, getting support for the war effort was a challenge. Due to his belief in publicity, Sam pulled out all the stops, setting up a speaker's bureau full of people ready to talk about the war and its importance to America, and also encouraging his own employees to join the war effort, which led to about one-fourth of Commonwealth Edison's employees entering the military during the war, as the company was continuing to fund their families while they were in the service. His efforts even managed to convince the residents of Illinois to buy 1.8 billion dollars in war bonds, double the national per capita average. Sam was becoming known for far more than his business sense. He received accolades from around the world for his wartime efforts. At the time, nobody outside of the government or military was as revered as Samuel Insull, though because of the rapid post-war price inflation, most utilities were suffering financially. By 1919, 91 transportation utilities had collapsed. Every major electric, gas, and transportation utility company except for Insull's Commonwealth Edison ended up increasing their rates. Yet, Insull's companies never failed to meet the growing demand for power, since he always built plants based on a statistically projected demand three years into the future. Sam also decided to sell preferred stock to as many employees and customers as possible, and because of this, the vast majority of his employees became stockholders. Each of his companies set up a stock selling operation, and all employees employees were encouraged to sell stock to their friends and neighbors, and the employees received commissions on whatever shares they sold. In just the 50 days preceding August 23, 1929, Insul Securities rose in value by roughly $500 million. Sam's own shares rose to a value of $150 million, over $2.5 billion in today's money. By 1930, Insul companies together had 1 million stockholders and bondholders. The empire he had built had 4 million customers, properties worth $3 billion, and produced about one-eighth of all the electricity in the United States. But here's where things began to go very wrong for Sam. In 1929, after supporting a plan to turn Chicago's transit system from private to quasi-public, with the service provided at cost instead of for profit, those that had invested in the system were worried of losing out on their anticipated returns. It resulted in a major publicity battle, which ended with Sam's plan being passed with a wide margin of votes, but causing many of the investors to despise Sam, and who now wanted to see him him fail. So when Sam admitted to donating about $160,000 to a candidate for senator from Illinois, his new enemies falsely claimed that the amount was $500,000 and that a $20 million utility deal was involved, leading to the headlines, Big Utilities Buying Elections. 
At the same time, the U.S. Senate was filled with controversy over the construction and operation of the Hoover Dam and the control of power in the Tennessee River Valley. Given the rising attacks on the utility industry, the Senate asked the FTC to investigate the big utilities and the utility holding companies. Sam's name was added to the top of the list of people worth investigating, and after a seven-year investigation and an 84-volume report, the future governor of Pennsylvania published a pamphlet condemning the utility industry. But in this pamphlet contained many factual errors exacerbating the attack, Senator Norris, leading the campaign for the public control of power in the Tennessee Valley, claimed that America's electric utilities were overcharging residential customers by $750 million per year. But in reality, the industry's total revenue from residences was only $650 million. Just as the suspicion of utilities in general, and Sam in particular, were heating up, the stock market crashed in September and October of 1929, inciting the Great Depression. However, Sam had seen recessions before, and he believed this one would be brief. He used his own personal collateral to cover all his employees' margin calls, saving many people and businesses from financial ruin. And when the city of Chicago was broke, Insul put together over $50 million in financing to pay firemen, police, and teachers. Later, during the Depression, his son organized one of the nation's first statewide programs to help the poor and unemployed. And despite the stock market collapse, Sam's companies remained strong in the early days of the Great Depression. The value of shares actually rose in 1930, and again through the first half of 1931. The companies invested $197 million in new facilities in 1930. In the midst of all this, Cleveland investor Cyrus Eaton had acquired a large block of stock in Ensel's companies. More shares than Sam himself owned. Some believe that Eaton was trying to take control from Sam. So Sam's Chicago bankers urged him to borrow the money to buy out Eaton. They promised to provide the necessary $48 million to do so. On four separate occasions, Insul refused, not wanting to take on the extra debt. But on the fifth try, in 1930, he caved in, making one of the worst business mistakes of his entire career. After agreeing to buy out Eaton, Sam found out the Chicago banks had changed their mind and would not fund the transaction. So he had to go to the New York bankers he had so often fought with in the past. The banks in New York demanded he put up personal collateral far exceeding the loan. At the same time, they began to spread rumors that Sam had either died or was insane in an effort to drive down the stock prices of insole companies. And over time, especially as the depression worsened, the shares began to fall. In one week alone in September of 1931, the value of the companies dropped by $150 million. And as the shares were falling, the bankers demanded more and more collateral from Insole, gradually acquiring voting control of all his companies. The aging Insole at this point did everything he could to avert disaster, cutting expenses and personally borrowing as much as he could. But the hole was only getting deeper, especially as news of Sam's troubles made headlines. The New York bankers coordinated with the board of directors at his companies to force Sam to resign. And he did, resigning every title he held in more than 60 corporations two days later. At depression-level prices, investors had lost hundreds of millions of dollars on their investments in his companies. The newspapers were full of stories of evil businessmen trying to control politics. Other stories claimed his empire had always been a house of cards just waiting to collapse. Sam was personally $16 million in debt with no assets left to his name. Exhausted, he decided to leave the situation in Chicago until people calmed down, so he moved to Paris. The year 1932 was also an election year, with Herbert Hoover and the Republicans heading for a resounding defeat. At first, Sam's many friends in both parties refused to use him as a scapegoat or campaign issue. On September 15, 1932, John Swanson, the Cook County State's Attorney, told his son-in-law, Sam Insull is the greatest man I've ever known. No one has ever done more for Chicago, and I know he has never taken a dishonest dollar. But Insull knows politics, and he will understand, but I've got to do it. Two hours later, Swanson held a press conference and announced he was launching an investigation into the Insull scandals. Politicians then competed in vilifying Insull. Presidential candidate FDR rewrote his speeches to include Insull, promising to get him. 
On October 4th, 1932, a grand jury indicted Sam Insull and his brother Martin for embezzlement and larceny. Convinced that a political lynching was underway, Sam decided not to return to Chicago until the climate improved. He told reporters he would gladly return to America if he was assured of a fair trial, not a political circus. With less than $3,000 to his name, he traveled to Italy and then to Greece, which had no extradition treaty with the United States at the time. His former employees were beginning to wire money to him to live on, but in the spring and summer of 1933, he, his son, and 17 others were indicted for mail fraud and violating the Bankruptcy Act. That October, President Roosevelt tried to get Mussolini to capture Insul in Italy, but Sam had already moved on to Greece. So Congress then rushed through a special bill authorizing the government to specifically arrest Samuel Insul in almost any country in the world. Now, he was out of places to run. In May of 1934, Sam Insul returned to America under heavy guard. Back in Chicago once again, Sam was thrown in jail. His lawyers negotiated a bail of $100,000 and they managed to come up with the money. But when they went to get him released, the prosecutors went back on the deal and demanded $200,000. The lawyers were ready to pay this, but Sam refused, not wanting to give in to the extortion or blackmail. He was finally released, awaiting his October 1934 trial for mail fraud. He used that summer to write his memoirs in an effort to set the record straight. As the trial began on October 2nd, 1934, government prosecutors made the case that Insul had used the mail system to unload worthless securities on an unsuspecting public. The 50-page, 25-count indictment listed 17 defendants. The lead prosecutor, future Illinois Governor Dwight Green, said Insul and his associates had run a simple conspiracy to swindle, cheat, and defraud the public. Every aspect of the trial would make headlines around the world daily. The government would throw everything they had at the case, with the best special prosecutor in the nation, Leslie Salter, having 198 convictions in 101 trials, joining the prosecution. In the first week of testimony alone, there were 83 witnesses. On November 1st, 10 days before his 75th birthday, Samuel Insull himself would take the stand. It was there he told the full story of his coming to America, working for Thomas Edison, and what he did for Chicago and the utility industry. Everyone in the courtroom was captivated, and when the prosecution team objected to his storytelling, the judge allegedly told them to sit down. On November 4th, the jury decided the case. They reached a verdict of innocent on all charges in five minutes. However, to make sure no one thought they had been bought, they waited two hours to return to the courtroom to announce their verdict. After the trial ended, two more trials began, with new charges on Insul, but again, he was acquitted on all charges. When all was said and done, Sam felt he could no longer stay in Chicago, as many people still hated him after all the accusations. He moved back to Paris, but his wealth had fallen from a peak of $150 million to just 10000 even after he left the business world, his impact continued worldwide. The United Kingdom carried out his plans for a government-owned electric grid. Throughout the remainder of the Great Depression, none of his companies went bankrupt. The strongest of his companies, Commonwealth Edison, never missed a single dividend. Today, that company has become Exelon, America's largest electric company and the largest non-government operator of nuclear power plants, with over 10 million customers and revenues exceeding $30 billion per year. On July 16, 1938, 78-year-old Samuel Insull died of a heart attack while awaiting a train in the Paris subway station. Since he had no wallet on him, the newspapers declared that he had died a poor man. Yet, everyone who was close to Sam said that he never left home without his wallet, usually with at least $1,000 in cash in it, even despite his lower net worth. So it's likely Sam's body had been robbed after he passed away. His biographer, Forrest McDonald, closed his story with the line, And so, in his death, as in his life, Samuel Insull was robbed, and nobody got the story straight. Thanks for watching. This has been a great series to make, and I hope you enjoyed it. If so, please consider giving it a like and subscribing to the channel. Thanks again, and I will see you in the next one.